Welcome to the TA training video on how to use the NMR and to run a Proton NMR sim. The first thing you'll want to do is log in to the NMR computer using the user and password information that's found to the upper left hand side of the computer. The username is organic and then the password is Kim exclamation point lab with some mixed in capitals. As you're typing this, you will not see the text appear on the screen, but after you've entered it, you can click the OK button. Before moving off the screen, I do want to mention, if you do not see the Solaris common desktop environment, then make sure you go into the options menu and select session common desktop environment. So once you've uh, ensured that it's on the common desktop environment, your password's entered in correctly, then you can click OK. So this is the main screen of the operating system. If it does not show the Indiana symbols with the white background, then you want to restart and again log in through that common desktop environment session. The only thing that we'll need is the icon down here that looks like an NMR trace. So that launches the NMR software. So this is the main display screen for the NMR software. As you're going through this process, there will be a sheet of paper that looks like this that is a, a job aid for running through the NMR. So as you're going through this video, um, or as you're preparing to run the NMR, note that you'll always have this sheet that goes through step-by-step -step instructions of how to run the NMR. So the first thing you'll do is type in load equals Y, SU load equals no. And what that's basically saying is it's going to load the shim file and then anything that you do to make adjustments to the shim file are going to be deleted. So the shim file that's set up by instrument specialists will be loaded but not overwritten by anything you do. Once you've done that, the next step is that you need to load the appropriate nucleus that you're studying, like a proton, and then pick the solvent. So in the setup menu, notice there's an option for H1 and CDCL3 right up here at the top. So the H1 and CDCL3 option would be what we use in this case. But you can also go into this nucleus solvent option right here. And then you can pick the proton H1 and then any other potential solvents. I'm going to select CDCL3. So now that that's been loaded, I'm going to type in another command, BP equals 12. This simply is a processing command that helps you print things out. But even if you run 20 samples, you only need to type this in once. So at this point, we're ready to insert our sample. So if you quick click on the ACQUI button in the main menu, so ACQUI, it opens up a dialog box that will have an option to insert or eject. So if you eject, that'll open up the sample compartment and the NMR tube inside will be available for you to take out. So there's the sample being ejected. When you're taking that sample out, notice that the glass tube is in a spinner, which is a plastic holder. When you're lifting that out, make sure you lift the plastic holder straight up and then out. If you lift it up and then start to pull away, you may run the risk of breaking the glass tube inside of that compartment, which would be disastrous and the NMR would have to be taken apart.
Once you've taken out the sample in the holder, remove the sample that's currently in the plastic holder. Be careful not to break the glass tube. Once removed, you'll take the sample that you're going to analyze that's already been prepared, push it down through the opening in the spinner, and then make sure to adjust the depth appropriately by using the depth guard. So that glass tube should just barely hit the bottom of that depth guard in order to appropriately give it its depth. At this point, you'll use the Kim wipe to wipe off the bottom of the glass so that you don't contaminate the probe inside of the NMR and also wipe off the top part of the holder so that your finger grease doesn't stop it from spinning. Then place the sample back into the open tube and make sure that it's free flowing and bobbing up and down freely. That tells you that it's set well inside of the sample tube. Once the tube's in, you can hit the insert button and that'll drop the tube back down into the NMR. At this point, we need to lock on the solvent that we preloaded. So we, we set this solvent as chloroform. Right now we need to maximize that lock on the signal coming from chloroform. So if we go over here to the lock menu, this will open up a whole toolkit of ways to maximize this lock signal. So currently the lock level, which is red right here, is at 35. Ideally we'd like that lock level to be around 50. And we want everything to be locked and shimmed as closely as possible um, to the ideal. One thing you want to make sure is that the values on this screen, the Z0 and the lock phase, are what's written to the, or to the left of the computer by the instrument specialist. So initially, these values, if they're set appropriately, you should not have to adjust. At this point, we'd move into the shim menu, which is up at the top. So the shim menu will now launch you into some manual adjustments that you can do to the shim values. This helps, again, maximize your lock signal. So before starting into the shim menu, make sure to click the spin toggle to on. So by selecting that, the spinner is now spinning inside of the NMR instrument at 20 revolutions per second. Most of your adjustments are going to come with the Z1C and Z2C. So as you're seeing the lock level at 36, you want to maximize that lock level by clicking left and right on these Z1C and Z2C buttons. So in order to maximize the signal, you'll use the Z1C and Z2C um, adjustments, which means literally you're adjusting the Z-axis to slight increments of the magnet. So the Z1C, you can left and right click. Left click lowers that value, and then right click raises it. So what I've just done has lowered the lock level. So as you go through, you can left and right click to maximize what appears to be the highest lock level. So here if I go over by right clicking further, notice the lock level has gone down again. So by clicking back, the lock level in that blue bar raises to its highest point. So once I've optimized Z1C, then I'll optimize Z2C right here and do the same thing. Notice I've changed it and it's gone down. Changed it and again it's gone up a little bit. But if I go too far past it to the right, then I need to compensate, go back to the left so that I get the maximum number possible. But once you've optimized the Z1C and Z2C, you can go back out to the lock menu up at the top 
and ensure that your lock level is right around 50, which ours is. So at this point, you're ready to close this window and prepare to run your sample. So to begin running your sample, you'll type in a lock equals no, and again, these are all written on the job age sheet. That auto lock equals n turns off the auto lock feature, and then the w shim equals n turns off the auto shim feature. That will cut off about three to four minutes off of each run. The next command, GA, actually starts your run, means go and acquire. So as soon as you start that, your sample begins to be analyzed. So the radio frequency scans are starting, and you can actually monitor how many scans are taking place by the CT. That's the count, the number of radio frequency scans that have occurred. A normal HNMR will undergo 16 scans, or 16 count. You'll notice it acquiring up to that level. If you notice an error during this time, like gain failure, pulse width driven to zero, you can adjust the pulse width, which is shown right here, pulse width is seven. So you can adjust the pulse width to lower numbers, such as PW equal two, if the sample is too concentrated. So the sample just finished running, and we can see our raw spectrum. At this point, the job aid asks you to enter a series of commands to process this so it looks like a usable NMR. The first thing is CZ. By typing in CZ and then hitting enter, that clears off any previous integration values. The next is APH. So by typing in APH and enter, your spectrum will be auto-phased. So now that your spectrum is auto-phased, the next thing you'll type in is D-scale. That displays the part per million scale on the x-axis. Next, you'll need to reference your x-axis scale using either the TMS peak at zero or preferably the solvent peak. Up above the NMR, there should be a piece of paper that gives the values of where specific solvent peaks will show up. For chloroform, which is what we're using, you'll see a CDCL3 peak at 7.26. And that's what we'll be looking for to reference on our screen. So we can see the TMS peak here at zero. But ideally, I'd like to reference the solvent peak around 7.26. So here's our solvent. Oftentimes, we'll show up just a little bit low. If I want to zoom in, I can left click, and you'll notice a red line here, right click, and then up in the menu, I'll click on expand. So that zooms in on that peak. If I left click in the center of the peak, and then up in the cursor box, type in RL, meaning reference line, parentheses 7.26 P, then notice it'll reference that specific peak at 7.26. So now we should see our TMS peak right at zero, which it is, and then our solvent peak should be right here at 7.26. At this point, you're going to start the integration of the peaks. There will be a button that starts at part, partial integral, part integral. You'll click that until it shows full integral. And notice this green line. Anytime you want to adjust the height of something, whether it's the peaks themselves or whether it's the integration line, you'll use the middle mouse button and then click and drag that up to the level you want it. So now we want to go through and actually integrate individual peaks. Here we can see a carboxylic acid hydrogen, some aromatic hydrogen. So we want to go through and actually integrate those peaks. To make it easier on myself, I'm going to zoom in by left-clicking and right-clicking, and then expanding. So as I go through to integrate, I'll first need to click on Resets, 
up here. And then I'm going to use the left mouse button to click on either side of the peak. And make sure to leave plenty of room. Remember not to integrate the solvent peak. So now everything is integrated and I can go out to my full spectrum by clicking on full. If there are small trace impurities like this small peak right here, you're welcome to also integrate that by clicking resets again and then left clicking on both sides of that peak. When you're finally done integrating, click the integral buttons back to partial integral, part integral. At this point, you're almost ready to print. One final thing is clicking on this TH button. That's the threshold of peak labels. Clicking it will bring up a yellow line and then you can left click to show the height you want that yellow line. That height will then give a peak label for any peak above that yellow line. So this seems like a good level and we can unclick the TH. So let's say at this point the peaks are maybe a little bit high, you'd like to lower them slightly. By middle clicking and then dragging down, you can make sure all of those peaks fit on the screen. So in order to print, there's a series of commands that you'll type in. PL, PScale, PAR, PLL, parenthesis, 105, 147, in parenthesis, and page. So the PL means print line. That's the actual NMR trace. PScale means print the scale. PIR means print the integration values, which will show up as numbers giving the relative area values underneath the peaks. PLL 105, 147 prints out the peak table. Remember that threshold, the yellow line. Anything that was a peak above that yellow line will print out in a table. And 105, 147 is just the location on the screen of where that shows up. The page sends that to the printer and will print out your spectrum. Usually I like to print out a full spectrum and then also print out a spectrum specifically of the most important peak areas like the aromatic peaks in this region. So by expanding this out, students are able to see any complex splitting much more easily. So once you've completed, you'll be able to hand students printed NMRs, a complete zoom out of the entire spectrum, usually 0 to 12, all the peak data is here. Notice the part per million values and the frequency values. The only difference is that the part per million values are multiplied times 200. 200 megahertz is the operating instrument of the machine to get the frequency values. And remember, the frequency values can help you get the J coupling values. On this diagram, which is a zoom in, you can see some of the splitting like in a doublet of doublet splitting here on the aromatic ring, a triplet of doublet splitting, and some other more complicated areas. Notice down below you can see the integration of the area under the curves, which shows a roughly one to one to two ratio of area. There's no substitute for practicing through using the NMR. So once you've gone through this video, take a practice sample and then go through all these techniques uh, by yourself and let me know if you have any questions.